and determination look like? To me, it looks a lot like Christina Rickardson. Born in a cave, living on the streets and in shanty towns, she experienced many things that would break many of us, but not Christina. After arriving in Vindel in the north of Sweden and enduring the culture shock of moving to a European country, she made the decision to stay positive and create her own destiny and is now thriving. Christina is an award-winning speaker and her first book, Never Stop Walking, was a huge success both in Sweden and abroad. We are honored to have Christina with us here today in the studio to share her story. Hi, everyone. First, I want to start by thanking all of you. I believe that one of the greatest gifts we can give another person is our time, so thank you for sharing your time with me today. I also believe that we are good at showing up, but we rarely show up to listen. We show up believing what we already know. Today, I am not going to stand here and tell you what is right and wrong. I believe that most of us understand that things like right and wrong, well, they wear different dresses. What I am going to do is to share part of my story, my experience and thoughts with you. I believe that in a world that changed so much and that challenged us so much, it's important for us to keep our humanity. It's also important for us to break stereotypes and to try to have an understanding for one another. For example, I was going to take me actually as an example, but I'm going to start by asking you guys a question. What do you see when you look at another person? Normally what we do is that we put people and things in a box and we label it. And labels are everything other than understanding or listening. For example, what do you see when you look at me? A woman, a black woman, a Swedish person. Who do I love? What religion do I have? Who am I? What box did you put me in? Did you put me in a positive or a negative box? And do you even know why you put me in that box? Who am I? Well, I was wonderfully introduced as Christina Rickardsson, best-selling author, award-winning speaker, but I haven't always been Christina Rickardsson. For better and sometimes worse, I'm bicultural. I have two identities, two countries, two nationalities, two families and two cultures. So basically, double trouble. I am made and I am created in two very different worlds. And it hasn't been easy. I have been lost. I have been divided. I have felt so much pain and sorrow. And I lost a lot of people. The first time I thought about killing myself, I was 10 years old. So how did I end up here today? People tell me that it is a great story, but for me, it's not a story, it's my life. I was born in 1983 as Christiana Mara Coelho on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in a small city, Diamantina, in the fifth largest country in the world, Brazil. The day that I took my first breath, I have been told it's the same day that a Swedish king turned 37, and hopefully he had a wonderful birthday. When it comes to what country, culture, family we are born into, this is totally out of our control. We cannot decide this. I call it the lottery of life. For example, the ticket that the Swedish king got was to be born into a family that was privileged, that had power, that had status and money, and to a solidarity strong country. I, on the other hand, the ticket that I got was to be born into poverty, into a country divided into rich and poor, black and white. Before I had the chance to show anyone who I was, 
what I could become. I was considered by many of my countrymen as a person that had nothing to contribute to society. I was thought of as a future threat, maybe a criminal, a prostitute. Simply someone not worth knowing, someone not worth giving a chance. As a newborn, I was, of course, unaware of this. I was unaware of the place that the world had put me in, the box and the label they already had given me. What I was aware of was my first home. It wasn't a house, it wasn't an apartment, not even a shed. It was a cave. I grew up in the wilderness of Diamantina, raised in this cave. My mom and I, we had nothing. We owned nothing. And I lived here for six years. There were two things that my mom and I had to fight out here. We fought the spiders, snakes, scorpions, the poisonous ones. And we fought hunger. And if you are thinking that we were a community of people living out here together, helping each other to survive, you could not be more wrong. It was just my mom and I fighting for surviving together. That hunger feeling that we fought, that is not a nice feeling. Have you ever been really, really hungry? Have you ever felt that burning pain that starts in the pit of your stomach and spreads to your whole body? until it doesn't hurt anymore. My mom would sometimes ask me, Christiana, does it still hurt? And I answered her, yes or no. As a child, I didn't understand why my mom would ask me this, but as an adult, I came to realize that, it, that she was checking where on the hunger scale her daughter was. Because when you do not have that burning sensation of pain anymore, then you know that you are starting to move over towards starvation. And when that happened, my mom and I, we would walk down to a red dirt road and we would walk 20 to 30 kilometers into the city. We would sit at the bus station. And I remember this walk well. I may not have been old, but the pain of walking without shoes for a long time when you are a small child and the pain of having your feet bleeding, that is something I think many of us would remember. My mom, she would pick leaves in the forest and she would put them on stones and dry them under the sun. And I, I would pick flowers to help her. So we took this into the city and we sat down there at the bus station and we tried to sell this so we could make a little money, buy food and support ourselves. I wish that I could tell you that we were successful in this, that my mom and I got a lot of the little we had with us sold. But sadly, that were rarely the case. 99% of the time, my mom and I, we had to start begging begging for food and begging for money. People, they would walk us by, they would pass us by, and they would look at us. Some would ignore us, others would spit at us, and some would call us name. Some got physical and kicked us. I remember sitting here as a five-year-old thinking that and not understanding why these people would treat us in this kind of way. My mom and I, we had done nothing wrong, we hadn't hurt anyone, and we were polite. I did not understand why they treated us like this. Just by existing, just by breathing, we were somehow annoying them. The worst thing here wasn't that people ignored us. The worst thing here wasn't that people hit us or that people called us name. The worst thing was to be ignored. Because when you are ignored, 
you are excluded. And when you are excluded, you do not belong, and we want to belong. I said in the beginning that one of the greatest gifts we can give another person is our time. One of the worst things, according to me at least, that we can do to another person is to kill hope. When you kill hope, you do something to that person. It's a feeling that goes deep inside your heart, your soul, and your spirit. And you stop feeling love. You stop feeling that you can create. You stop feeling that you can grow. It's important to give each other hope, because hope is love. Hope is creativity. Sometimes, some people would give us some food. They would give us some money. And what my mom would do is that she would buy rice or food, and then we would walk back to our home, to our cave. And out here, it was very tough for us. It was a tough life. But I also remember this time with a lot of joy and a lot of happiness, because it was just me and my mom out here. So I got all her time, all her attention, and all her love. And I think that we today are forgetting how important this is to give of our time, our love, and attention. We easily give our children a cell phone, an iPad. We allow them to be on social media. And I am not against technology, on the other hand, but I don't think that technology should substitute human interaction and love. And Instead of that, we are striving to get more likes. That is not love, that is not time, that is not to feel seen. My mom and I, we would climb on top of our mountain and we would sit there for hours and she would tell me stories and I was so fascinated by them. And I remember one time asking my mom, mom, can we sit on clouds? Can we fly? And my mom, she looked at me, and she gave me the most amazing smile, and she told me, Christiana, nothing is impossible. I would truly want all of us, all of you, to think about this. A woman born into poverty, raising her daughter in a cave, tells her daughter that nothing is impossible. If a person that has nothing truly believe, which my mom did, that nothing is impossible, imagine what someone that has something, what they can do. One night, my mom and I, we were chased out of our cave. There were men with guns chasing us. I don't know why, I was just a child. I just remember running in the forest with my mom, scared. If there were night hunting, or if there were men that had heard of the woman who lived in the cave and had come to try to have their fun, I don't know. What I do know is that my life came to change. Then the next day, my mom and I, we started a long walk to Sao Paulo, the biggest city in Brazil and in South America. And this life in the cave had been tough on us. It was nothing compared to what a life on the streets of Sao Paulo and in the favelas came to be. My mom taught me that in the wilderness that this snake that is red, that is white, and that is red, white, and black is poisonous. This snake will kill you. This spider that has this shape can jump and is poisonous. But sitting here on the streets of Sao Paulo, because we had nowhere to live, and my mom had no education, she could write her name, but that's it. And sitting here, you know, looking at all the people passing us by, I could not look at a color, black, white, brown, and say that this is the person that I, this is the color that I should stay away from. I could not see a shape and say that this shape is danger. Instead, I came to learn that, they were, that it was those people that actually smiled a little extra friendly towards me. 
They were the ones that I should stay away from. They were danger. At the age of six, I learned that a smile is danger. My mom, she tried to get a job. At least that's what she told me. And that led to that I was left on the streets and in the favela by myself sometimes. And a child, especially at that age, six, seven years old, left on the streets of Sao Paulo, well, you are an easy prey and you don't survive for long. So I ended up in a group of street children and together we survived. We became a family, we helped each other, we, we worked on the streets and we also stole food to survive. In this group of uh, children, I came to know a little girl named Camille, and she became my first best friend. Can you remember your first best friend? Can you see the picture of her or him? Feel the feeling you had towards the person, that special connection that you get with that, with that friend? Camille was that person to me. She and I, we became more than friend. She became my sister. We would do everything together. We would, you know, fight. We would survive, steal, share food together. And this little girl, she had an amazing gift. And I am this kind of person that, I'm a little nerdy, I am this kind of person that believes that everyone has a gift, at least one gift, if not more. But if we are capable of seeing that gift, that is another, another thing. Camille's gift was to tell story. She was a storyteller. And when she sat down in the favela, all the children would gather around her and it would become quiet and everyone would listen and enter one of her magical word, words. Camille did not only tell story, she did something else. She spread hope. Because every day on the street, every day, we were told that we had nothing to contribute to the society. We were told that we were not worth putting energy, time, education to. We were told that we were street rats, cockroaches. We had no value to the society. We were criminals. And this little girl, by telling her story, she would take us from a world that looked at us like that and into a world where we, the street rats, we could become heroes. And that is an amazing thing. She gave us so much more than stories. One night in the favela, Camille and I, we decided to sleep outside, on the outskirt of the favela. And the reason we chose to do this was because there were a street war being fought inside our favela. There were the drug dealers, the military police, and the police fighting. And when this happens, a lot of innocent people, they die. And Camille and I, we knew the risks of sleeping on the outskirt of our favela, but we decided that that was probably the best idea. I remember waking up that night. I heard there was some sound that I heard, and I remember thinking, what is that? And I woke my friend Camille, and she looked at me. So I put my finger to my mouth, and I hushed her. And then I put it to my ear, and I signed towards the building, the corner of the building, to show her that I had seen something, that I had heard something. And Camille, she looked at me, and she nodded. That was a sign that she understood and, and that we should look around the corner to see if it was danger or just a street dog or something else. It wasn't uncommon that we had to move several times during one night. When Camille and I looked around the corner, we saw men with guns, we saw the military police, and we saw four or five children. This is something that every street children in Brazil knew about and still today know about. 
We turned quickly around and were, were about to run for our lives. When one of the men sees us and he yells, grab them. To try to explain how it feels to be seven years, years old and to run, to literally run for your life, to have panic fill your whole body, I cannot. I have never been so scared in my whole life. Camille's gift was that she was a storyteller. My gift in life is that I am athletic. I am very fast and I love to run. And this night I was running for my life and Camille and I, we were just screaming to each other, run, run faster. And while I was running, I see this wall in front of me. And it's not like I run and I stop and I, I try to get up on the wall. I throw myself onto the wall and I manage to get my fingers on the edges. I remember thinking then that it was so strange that I could feel how my body hit the wall, how I lost all the air in my body, but I couldn't feel any pain. I remember thinking this should hurt. It was very strange how time could go so fast and at the same time so slowly. Everything felt like slow motion. I came, I managed to get myself on top of the, of the wall and I turned around to do what Camille and I had done so many times. I give her my hand and I pull her up and help her because Camille was not athletic at all. But when I look back, that is when I see that my friend has fallen behind. I see how two men grab her and how she is fighting, her little body is fighting, trying to get loose. One of the men let go of Camille and I was panicking so much seeing my friend being caught and at the same time seeing this man moving towards me. And I remember that I did not know what to do at all. And then I hear my friend scream at me, Christiana, run! Without knowing that I had made this decision, I am on the other side of the wall and I am running for my life, leaving my friend behind. And after I had run for a while, you know, I looked back to see if the man was still following me, and he wasn't. And that is when I stop, and I start to think and start to understand what just had happened to us. All the stories we children had told each other was now happening to us, me and my friend. At seven years old, I made a decision that I today can be proud of. I decided to try to find a way back, a different way, back to that place. I did, I managed to do that. And that night, I am standing behind another building, looking at the same situation from another angle, and now, I see my friend Camille standing there with the other children. I tried to think of some way to, find, to help her. And uh, at the same time, I was so afraid that the men would see me and that I would have to run for my life again, or even worse, that they would actually catch me too. And while I'm standing there, trying to figure out a way to save her, I see how something happens to her forehead. I hear the shots and I see how my friend's body fall to the ground in the most strange way I have seen a body fall, lifeless. That night, the people that get paid because, believe it or not, poor people pay taxes too. That get paid to protect us. They killed all those children. I knew, we all knew, street children know this, you know, that we are considered as less. 
that our human value are less to our society. But to actually see them kill us like that, that I, can, I cannot and I will never be able to describe that feeling. The feeling of not having any human value at all. I think that what saved me that night was two things. The shock of seeing this, I couldn't even scream. And the second thing was what happened earlier when my friend screamed at me, Christiana, run. She could have asked for help. I can promise you this, I know for sure I would have screamed to her to come and help me. But instead, she told me to run. She saved me, and I could not save her. That night, I ran from this horrible place, and I ended up under a staircase where Camille and I sometimes slept together. And, uh, you know, I threw up. It became dark, and it became light again. And I don't know if it's because it was a new day, and it was night, you know, or if I just passed out and came to. What I do know is that my mom, who came and, and went, she found me. She knew where Camille and I lived, you know. And she found me and she did what grown-ups can be so good at. She sat down and she started to stroke my hair and my cheeks, and she was listening to me. And I told her about what had happened. And my mom listened. And after a while, I don't know how long, my mom stood up and she gave me her hand and she told me, Christiana, promise me something. Whatever happens in life, never stop walking. I wish that I could tell you guys that at the age of seven, I was that smart that I understood what my mom wanted to tell me. I wasn't. I literally thought that she meant that there were a place where I could go, and if I went there, I would get rid of all of these huge feelings that I was feeling, you know. I was feeling so sad, hate, frustration. I was missing my friend. I felt injustice. And if I went to this place, all those feelings would disappear. And maybe, just maybe, my friend Camille would be there too. So I asked my mom, but mom, where should I go? And she tells me, it doesn't matter where you go, as long as you don't stop walking. I remember that I took her hand and we stood up and we started walking taking the first steps to healing. In 1991, I was adopted. My brother and I was adopted after living one year in an orphanage in Sao Paulo. Lilian and Sture from the north part of Sweden, they came to Sao Paulo and they took us to a new world. This new world was very strange to me. I have felt, I have gone through many cultural shocks within my own country, living in a cave, moving from a cave to the streets and from the streets to favela, from favela to an orphanage. But coming to Sweden was a huge cultural shock and I don't think that I will ever experience something like that again. Everything in this new country was different. Everything. The sun felt different against my skin. The air did so too. The smell was different. Everyone spoke this weird language that I could not understand. And, you know, you listen to music that was so different from the Brazilian one. The food tasted different. Everything was so so different. And in one way, it was very exciting. In another way, it was a huge shock to me. It was scary. But the biggest thing, the biggest difference, wasn't how the sun 
you know, felt against my skin or the food or the, the language or the difference in the religion and so on. It was me. I was different from everyone else. I looked different. I acted differently. And I talked and spoke and thought and had different values. And I came to understand that Christiana, this Brazilian little girl, had no place anymore in this new world. I came to create a new identity, Christina. All the time while doing this, not understanding why this new society, at least it felt like this new society, demanded that I lost, that I, I put away everything that was not known to them. So, that, so I could fit in. I did not understand why I had to do that, but I did it. I prayed a high price, but I did it. What, I'm gonna be honest with you, what sometimes annoys me though is that after all of that, after putting one identity away and creating another identity to fit into a new world, to this new culture, there is still some people today that will look at me and because of something so small and so insignificant as the color of my skin, they would tell me that this country, Sweden, you do not belong here. It's weird, isn't it? That something so small can have so much power sometimes. It wasn't easy becoming Swedish. And sometimes I should not have tried so hard. This picture is proof of that. And I came to learn a lot of things. One of the things that I came to learn during this huge cultural shock was that if I am standing over here, looking over there, which I was doing a lot of time, looking at the Swedish people, thinking, what is going on over there? What are they doing? Not understanding. I came to realize that they are probably also standing over there looking at me and thinking, what is she doing? What is she doing? And not understanding. As an eight-year-old, I started to realize that the only way to actually understand each other and come closer to each other is to communicate and is to have patience and to try to understand someone else's situation. Identity is something personal. It is, it is easy to forget that. I grew up in a world on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean telling me that I was not good enough, that I did not have money enough, I did not have status, I did not have the right color on my skin, and so on. I was told that I was a rat, that I was a cockroach. I have met many people in my life that have told me who I am and what I can do and cannot do. I have learned that they have no right to do this. And I have also learned that I have no right to tell you who you are, what you can do, and who you should love or whatever you want to do. I have no right to say that. Your, your identity is yours. So, if you don't want anyone to tell you this, please don't take anyone else's identity away from them either. Once upon a time, when I was sitting on top of my cave with my mom when I was five years old, she told me that nothing is impossible. So I started to fly. I started believing in myself. She gave me that hope, that love, to be strong enough to believe in myself. And I started to fly, and every time I fly and I pass a cloud, I see my mom and I sitting on top of our cave, and I see her smiling towards me, and I feel that love and hope. And every time in my life that I feel insecure, that I feel that I'm going to fail, or that someone else is telling me this, I remember those words. It's so easy to forget what builds a human up and what breaks a human. Three little words can build someone up and three little words can break them. Have you ever stopped to think about how you treat other people, what you, what you tell them, what you say? 
Are you encouraging them or are you breaking them down? My teacher told me, my Swedish teacher told me that I would never be a writer. I would never write a book. And it's not up to him to decide that. So I decided to tell my story, never stop walking, the words that my mom had once told me. And it became a bestseller in Sweden, in Brazil, on Amazon. And I'm not telling you this to brag or anything. I'm telling you this because even if someone is a professional and tells you that you cannot do something, you should not listen to that person. If you really want to do something, if you really believe in yourself, you can. So I did that. But what I have come to learn is that even if the greatest power is inside of ourselves, if we say, I am good enough, then we will be good enough. If we tell ourselves we are not good enough, we will become that. So even if that power, the greatest one, is inside of us, it's so much easier if we actually help each other, if we support each other, if we give each other kindness, love on our journey in life. That I have learned. And I try, I will not lie and say that I su succeed all the time because I don't, but I try to live by that. I try to treat other people the way that I would like to be treated, to get a smile, to say hi, to tell them at least that I see you. It doesn't cost me anything to do that. Actually, it gives me something. It gives me joy in life. I am a much better person when I do that than when I don't. I would like to leave you with two things. My mom once told me that nothing is impossible. I believe her. And she also told me to never stop walking. This is what I believe. I believe that every person on this planet are bound together, not by culture, not by religion, not by nationality. I believe that we are bound together by our feelings, we can understand each other through our feelings. We are all the same there. And I believe that every one of us will feel joy, happiness and love at least one time in life. I also believe that, sadly, we will feel pain, we will feel sorrow and, you know, loss. And when we do that, when we feel this, it's very important that we don't stop walking. That we, take, that we keep climbing this hill that we have to get over, or this mountain, this Everest, our Everest. And the important thing is not what we find on the other side of the mountain, it is to get there. I have climbed many Mount Everest in my life, and I have found something else on the other side. So I want to end this by answering the question, I asked in the beginning of this lecture, who am I? Well, I'm like you. I'm a human being. I'm different. So are you. I am no more and I am no less. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today and take care of yourself and each other. Thank you. has come to define the importance of an online business. Earning an extra source of income from the safety of your own home has never been more prominent. To build on this, we set out to create the ultimate online business right in your pocket. Introducing Crowd1. Crowd1 is a leading global crowd marketing force set out to empower people all around the world. Our vision is to provide sustainable business opportunities for everyone. That includes you. Through Crowd1's easy-to-use, all-in-one software, you are able to create and grow your own team. You and your team then recommend and distribute groundbreaking online products, carefully crafted to the core, whilst earning commission. 
mobile gaming, e-learning, digital travelling agencies and more. With CrowdOne's wide library of products and services, there is always a product that fits your customers' needs, maximising your ability to market them. Organising your work is important too. The CrowdOne platform is optimised for keeping structure and managing your business. Additionally, we provide education and training in entrepreneurship to help you on your way to success. These three components work in harmony to create the best version of yourself and your team. With over 25 million members, great products and services, and the right tools at the tip of your fingers, join us today and be part of the future.